FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. And welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. It's What's Going On Wednesdays with Andrew Hoffman. And the date here is May 20th, 2015. Who would have thought we could ever get this far without a major calamity, a major collapse? But how much longer will we get is really the question. And the answer is not too much longer the way things are looking now. (laughs) What are your thoughts? Well, my thoughts are that a lot of that horrible crisis has happened. Well, first of all, what happened years ago, but what what's going on in the world right now? Again, secular Americans don't realize that the average currency around the world has fallen by more than 40 percent since the Fed started its recent round of, of money printing madness, you know, with QE uh, starting in late 2011 with Operation Twist and QE2 and QE3 and what well, the, all the other central banks are doing. In fact, the fragile five currencies where a quarter of the world's population lives, uh, it's far worse, the currency decline. And the BRICS, which are supposedly, you know, the emerging growth of the world, the average currency is down 90 percent against the dollar in the last four years. And that's excluding the Chinese yuan because it's pegged to the dollar. So just those four currencies are down that much, uh, which shows you that there's plenty of calamity around the world. And as we were discussing before the call, you know, the commodity collapse, which, you know, what I wrote about in the direst prediction of all, uh, is going to go on for years to come because of all the overcapacity that was created because of what David Stockman brilliantly deems uh, deformation is only getting worse. The CRB commodity index, even with the oil PPT, having pushed oil from 42 up to 58, is nearing, again, its lows from February, which are basically the same lows as the bottom of 2008. That's how many other uh, commodities which don't get as much press have been falling. I mean, coal, steel, even rice is plunging. Lumber, of course, you know, the the bedrock of the housing uh, recovery that doesn't exist is uh, is at multi-month lows. I think it's down 30% this year alone. So there's been plenty of calamity around the world. And then you look at what's going on in all these countries like uh, Greece with Catalonia, Spain. I mean, uh, what's going on in Central America and now Puerto Rico, which is going to be the next big uh, bomb after Greece. And, you know, the U.S. government backs that the way they back Fannie Mae. So there's plenty of calamity. But yes, because the PPDs of the world have been able to push to create uh, bubbles in the stock markets, it hasn't felt like to the average person uh, that we've had, that we're in the middle of a 2008. But the fact is, economic activity around the world, including here, is worse than 2008. As is debt, unemployment, inflation, you name it. Yeah, uh, obviously, yeah, uh, yeah. I say it somewhat facetiously. It's been a, it's been like a slow moving uh, train wreck just waiting for it to crash into that wall or like it's been, we're basically the Amtrak economy here. One, one <laughs> crash title. after another. There's right? your title. <laughs> yeah. We're the Amtrak yeah, it economy. Is, it is remarkable. I mean, the whole story of Amtrak, um, and you could read again, David Stockman wrote a, a long article. He knows all the history of it, but the fact that this, you know, this, uh, it's really a, become a government entity and it's just so typical of anything the government runs. It's no different than Fannie Mae. It's just, Taking this this uh, this business that's no longer needed and running into the ground at the expense of taxpayers and lives, and uh, they just keep pouring more money into it. And then you know, right after this happens, like two days later, you know, they're like cutting funding to Amtrak, and it's a whole big thing with John Boehner, like almost blaming Obama for it. And it's like, yes, let's cut funding to, to these guys who don't have enough safety in their that so that they have crashes all the time. Yeah, just <laughs> it's just amazing, isn't it? I mean, it's no different than the post office, except that people die. I mean, shut the thing down because all it, it's unnecessary and all it does is, is suck up taxpayer funds. The only reason it's around is because it's jobs. If they shut it down, they'd have to fire, I don't know, how many people, 5,000, 10, 20,000 people. So they just keep funding it with printed money. But the fact is that all it is is just a waste and, it, and it, it's a vulture on society. And in this case, it kills people, Yeah, which nothing. is not much different than most of what our military does. oh you're so right hey but this is a this is a modern day america today here andy this is what uh, they're supposed to do 
I mean, it, it is. It really is the microcosm. I mean, the, the post office is the perfect example. I think I did a piece on it a few years ago. I'm pretty sure the post office was it the third or the second largest uh, employer in the country. I think Department of Defense uh, is number one, and then uh, and they're number two. And neither of them do anything for the country except suck up funds. And uh, in the case of, of the military, obviously, the, the damage is so much more collateral <laughs> because of uh, how much everyone hates us around the world. But, uh, you know, that's what they do. Anything that'll keep jobs, even if they're useless jobs, you know, the, the proverbial, you know, digging ditches and filling them back up. That's what Amtrak is. Yeah. Or uh, it's just like prisoners. Uh, give them big rocks and have them break them up into little rocks and hopefully keep them out of trouble in the process. It's yeah. No different. <clears throat> Except people die. But, you know, again, that's the extent of, uh, of the economy these days. It's uh, inventory building. If you even believe any of the numbers they put out, it's now prostitution and drug dealing, which counts as GDP, so that the debt to GDP ratio can look lower than it is. Uh, it's military defense contracting. Like, what was it last month? We've had, I think we've had six months in a row of capital spending declines. But last month, we had a big increase. Of course, excluding government, it was down, but because of huge government spending on jets to go bomb people, which net net only makes you know our economic situation and the world's economic situation worse. Yeah. Um, what is the government doing here? And what have they been doing for, I guess, generations? What is the point of this government that we've got? I, I just don't understand it. Um, That's what happens at the end of empires. They become, you know, they go, they become socialist and then communist because there's so many people that need them. There's, so, I mean, because of, I mean, partly because of secular changes like the, you know, the jobs going west or east, I should say, which would have happened no matter whether we pushed them there or not. Uh, you know, this we they they have the fiat currency system that builds debt and upon debt upon debt and it kills the economy and then everyone's dependent on the government. So the government just, uh, you know, votes themselves larger and larger. and No one complains to the point where they run everything and they run everything into the ground and make things worse. Yeah. And they're doing a fine job of it, aren't they? At an increasing rate. And now, you know, the big thing I, we were talking about two weeks ago, you know, the tectonic shifts. And I wrote an audio, uh, did an audio blog called Tectonic Shifts. A market shifts portend disaster about this surging interest rates, no matter what happens. In fact, there's been 10 days in a row at 1.30 Eastern Standard Time. Uh, Zero Head just caught on to that. It's kind of like the gold cartel. Someone is selling. And, you know, it's funny. I was making fun of Zero Edge the other day because they still can't figure out the gold car manipulation story. But they are right on top of the, you know, the mysterious Belgian uh, buyer of treasuries. They did this brilliant piece two days ago showing how, you know, they overlaid it with Chinese holdings. And it really, to me, looks like the Chinese were fronting. It wasn't the Europeans. It was the Chinese that were buying them. And now the Chinese are selling them because uh, the mysterious Chinese Belgian holdings are plunging. Uh, you know, I think the Chinese are selling in a big way uh, U.S. Treasuries. And they are the reason why, no matter how bad the economic data, how deflationary things look, how dovish this, the Fed sounds, rates keep going up. And, you know, I mean, we all know that rates eventually are going to explode. The, the bond vigilantes are going to sense hyperinflation at some point. But I really sense here that this is the Chinese that are the primary source, whether they're doing it aggressively or because they need money to fund their own problems, like the QE, pro the QE program that they just started this week to bail out all their insolvent municipalities. So, you know, I mean, the worst possible thing imaginable for the U.S. government is rates going up even a tiny bit. And the housing bubble and the stock bubble and everything, which is why it's so interesting that the Fed has to has to give their <clears throat> minutes publication a couple hours from now, where you know that they're going to be even more dovish than they were in April because they doctor the minutes, which is only going to foster, you know, the fear of global currency wars. And of course, put a floor under gold and silver, yeah, regardless of what they do today to gold and silver the second it comes out. Yeah, do me a favor, Andy, just explain what the uh, what the uh um, QE in China, exactly what they're doing there for the, yes. uh, for all the local municipalities that are in a heap of trouble. Right. Well, unlike the ECB or the bank of Japan or the fed, they don't have like a monthly meeting like, and say, okay, here's what we're doing, but they do make, they certainly do a lot of over things. They've changed, they've uh, reduced, um, uh, capital requirements for the banks. They've lowered the, the uh, reserve requirement uh, rate and even their equivalent of the Fed funds rate a couple of times. They don't they don't do it per meeting, but they do it and it's noticed and it has an impact on markets. Um, but what they're doing now is about two weeks ago, we talked about this. 
they floated a trial balloon. It's like, you know, like they do in the West, they get their, their, their uh, media to write, the government is thinking about a program where it will swap Chinese government bonds for municipal bonds of you know, municipalities that are in, in bad shape. Uh, so essentially, the government's kind of guaranteeing it and giving them a lower rate. That's QE because there's you know billions and billions that need to be done. So essentially, they're monetizing bad debts of their municipalities, which are huge. I the mean, trillions. <laughs> yeah, in the trillions. Or am I crazy here? I, I don't know what the number is, but it's a big number. I mean, we're talking about hundreds and thousands of cities that have all been fostered, had this bubble fostered by the, the Chinese government on them. So they're all in the same boat. Um, I mean, look, we, we saw it today. We saw we've seen the worst export numbers. We've seen fall uh, ever. We've seen the lowest GDP growth ever, the lowest capital spending ever in China, or at least 30 years worth. I mean, it's falling apart there. So they are doing the equivalent. You know, they're in the equivalent of, our, of a 2008 there, except that they also are fostering a stock bubble. So again, like we started this call, it doesn't feel like it to the world. But economically speaking, things are worse in China right now than anywhere on the planet. <laughs> but man, the, that printed money feels so good until it doesn't anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, look at the currencies again. It, you know, it's it started. And I've said I've said all along, again, you never know what will happen in these rig markets, but my premise for two years has been the dollar index, not the dollar's you know, purchasing power like against real items of value, but the dollar index is going to soar because all the global money printing you know, causes the lesser currencies, which include the Chinese yuan right now, uh, you know, to fall apart. And when there's fear, everyone runs into the most liquid currency, which is the dollar. And so when you see all this QE and economic uh, collapse, that's exactly what happens. And the dollar has exploded against all these currencies. It had a brief respite for a couple of weeks, partly because I believe the oil PPT and the copper PPT were doing their thing, and partly because of just technical factors. But here we go again. The dollar is exploding higher against everything. And it's not because of, look at our GDP last quarter and where it stands this quarter. It's not because of, the, because of uh, what's going on here. It's uh, because of fear. And that's only going to cause more and more money printing overseas, and it's going to cause more and more pressure on the Fed to loosen their policies. Because heck, the White House itself is telling the Fed we don't want a strong dollar, meaning don't you dare do anything hawkish as if they would anyway, because our economy is falling apart. Yeah, that it is. We know this. Is there any question that our uh, economy is falling apart? No, it's it's singularly today the worst it's been in my lifetime. Uh, this minute, this this day, there is no day before it where you could say that it that it was worse. And again, the only difference between now and 2008 was the PPTs hadn't realized hadn't yet commandeered financial markets. They know now that they can't let the Dow ever fall because the second it falls, it's like the other day I saw the German stock market was down. I don't know, 2.5 percent or something, which happens all the time in Europe. 2.5 percent on the Dow would be what 450 points here. They would declare, the media would declare, we're in 2008 all over again if the Dow fell 400 points in one day. One day, that's all. Even 400 points from its all-time high. If the NASDAQ fell 200 points from its all-time high, of where 5,000 now, we would be declaring that it's 2008. That's how conditioned people have been by the, by the Fed's printing money and manipulating markets to, be, to, to, to think of the market declining because it never declines. And now all the central banks of the world have caught on to this, that you can't let the market decline. In fact, some of them, like the Swiss bank and the Bank of Japan, their official policy is they're telling you, you know, it's like we say, we're, the Fed says we're monetizing uh, treasuries and mortgages. They say we're buying stocks. So it's gotten to the point where, you know, you can't even look at the stock market anymore to try to figure out if it means anything. It doesn't mean anything. Of course, the average person, as the economy gets worse, um, has less and less, and the one percent get more and more as the market goes up. So again, you're talking about some, you know, some huge chasms between reality and uh, and and markets that are opening up. And you know, I mean, it's going to at some point collapse uh, spectacularly. Uh, you know, pot potentially much sooner than people can imagine. Yeah, and that is what's what's really scary is that nobody is prepared for this collapse except a very small sliver, Andy, of, of society. Very small sliver. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it, it terrifies me to no end. You know, my goal years back when I started writing, 
you know, I probably started writing publicly or three or four, you know, um, you know, it was always to, Hey, get one or 2%, especially after 2008 occurred. And I, you know, it really shocked me that, you know, the things I was expecting were vastly worse and, and vastly more near term was that, you know, we're never going to get more than one or 2% of the world to listen. And then most of that's going to happen at the very end. You know, like when gold is 2000 bucks, then everyone will start to listen. And of course, by then there'll be no gold left to buy. Uh, so it won't matter. But uh, if we can just find the small amount of people, you know, you have your right brain, your left brain, there's some part of everyone's brain uh, that's shut off, except for a very few people like us who actually will, you know, go against human nature and, and seek the truth as opposed to what's told to them. Yeah, well, I think there are more people uh, out there now than ever before, though, Andy. You know Absolutely. You know but that. the brainwashing is incredible. Like the piece that I, I wrote yesterday, it's going to come out today. I don't know if you saw this on um, on CNBC. Well, I mean, I saw it on Zero Hedge, so I clicked on it. They had the uh, National Economics Challenge, right, for like college and high school students. And, um, and they showed the winners of the challenge. There's a bunch of kids, you know, 20 years old, 18 years old. And Steve Leisman, of course, is interviewing them. And he's, he asks them, what's your favorite economist? And they all say Keynes. I love Keynes. He spends a lot of money. And I'm going, wow, the brainwashing. I was like, this is an Atlas shrug moment here. I mean, this is the youth of the world. That's why my, uh, my article yesterday was called, if these children are our future run. <laughs> uh, they love Keynes. Oh, they love him. God. They love him. He spends a lot of money. That's what one guy said. <laughs> Well, if that's the uh, test, then then they should love them. And the funny thing is that people don't understand. Even you know, some people who they kind of understand uh, economics, they hear Keynes and Keynesianism, they think of monetary policy like lower interest rates and that kind of stuff. But they don't realize that the what, what Keynesianism really means is across all aspects of finance, the government should intervene. That includes fiscal policy, like doing stimulus packages and cash for clunkers. And of course, you know, monetary policy by lowering rates to zero and printing money and buying stock markets. And I mean, they're basically these, these kids who are admiring a man who is a communist. I mean, that's, I, yeah. I mean, that's the definition of a communist and communism, not good for business and certainly not good for living standards. Oh, it's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard, but uh, there's economic ignorance all over the world. And yeah, I had a guy on, uh, what's his name? Bruce Price, who's been detailing everything uh, that's wrong with the educational system. So you can't be too surprised that they're this dumbed down, Andy, because they are and dumbed I, and, down. And it's, it's, I don't even think it's so much that like it comes from the government yet. Like you have to write in your textbook. I think it's just been four decades of, of, uh, of, of a fiat currency money system in which the U.S. has been the reserve currency of people actually just believing that this is the way things are supposed to be. Um, and, you know, as things get worse, though, the government does start to intervene more uh, in, in what the Fed does and what the and what the people are told. And um, that's when you start to get to the Atlas Shrugged Big Brother world, um, both economically and, and socially. And it's gets it's getting scary. I mean, I very fearful for what the world my um my three-year-old is heading into it ain't going to be pretty that much we know for sure it ain't going to be pretty and they can love canes all they like but in the final analysis canes ain't going to save them because nobody can save them nobody can save the world economy it's sinking into this morass and there's no superman out there to come to our rescue, unfortunately. Anyway, find Andy's work over at milesfranklin.com, his daily missive, his audio blog, and check us out at financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Sign up for a newsletter, our free webinars. Got one coming up today. Andy, always a pleasure. Talk to you next week. Look forward to it. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.